With all that said, grab your Bibles, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. We're going to be picking up where we left off from last week. That's kind of like what we do here, right? So verse by verse, chapter by chapter. I know I said that backwards. Chapter by chapter, verse by verse, line upon line, precept upon precept. I was thinking about this this morning as I was kind of getting ready for the study, and I was thinking, I don't think most pastors would say, this is what I want to teach on Sunday morning. Like, it wouldn't be a great topical. It's, it's a lot of correction. But I'm so thankful because in it, we need to hear it. We need to hear all of the Word of God. Not just the good stuff. Not just the, the stuff that makes us feel good and charge out. We also need to hear the ones where the Spirit, through the Word, through Paul, is, is kind of saying, hey, check yourself before you wreck yourself, Right? And so we need that stuff this, the, the, throughout life, and so we're going to get a little <laughs> spoonful of that this morning. Uh, uh, and so praise God. So 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Now this is, by nature, this is a corrective epistle. Paul's not coming in showing us lofty theological ideas. He does that in Romans. He does that in Ephesians. Paul's coming in to correct the church to correct some mistakes. And we've already been seeing in the first three chapters these mistakes. And really, this is a continuation of the thought through those first three chapters. And chapter four, this is the last chapter to address the main issues that have been going on thus far in uh, the church for, for all of this kind of flowing section. It's big. There weren't, there weren't originally, there weren't chapter breaks. So this is like almost like breathe, Paul. And he's going to stop at the end of this chapter and breathe a little bit. Um, but it's like I said, it's corrective. And in this chapter, what he's going to address and what he has been addressing, the main issue has been division in the church. Division in the church, which can still be a problem today. It can still be a problem in our modern uh, churches. And, and I, when I think about it, in our churches today, it's easy to kind of get little circles or little clicks that maybe not the intention, but they'll end up leaving people out, somebody on the fringes. And I mean, for us to look at this, I think it's a good time, and I'm, I'm going to get to this again, but it's a good time for us to stop and think, how can I include people? How can we bring everybody in? How can we, how can we not, and especially to see someone on the fringe and say, hey, come here. Come in in this and, and be a part close uh, with us and in our circle and make people feel included. We never want that to happen, but what we need to know here is that Paul, because he's warning us of this, we need to know that it can and will and does sometimes happen in our lives. And I think to myself, I don't want to give excuses, but you people are humans. I'm a human. We're subject to the fall and flaws and mistakes. And sometimes people read into a mistake and think you did it on purpose. And we're like, I didn't do it on purpose. I'm sorry. Or whatever the case may be. But we need to walk in this life with grace towards other. And also to just check ourselves. And as he's addressing this topic, it's good for us to, as, to think about it and become aware of of our lives and hopefully steer clear of it. Amen. So we want, our desire is that love would be without hypocrisy, that we would be genuine in our love for others in the body of Christ. Now in the, in the Corinthian church, they were dividing themselves by teachers. You guys probably remember that they were making themselves out to be more spiritual by which teacher that they followed. And they, Paul had the little list, right? Paul, Apollos, Cephas, which is another name for Peter, and of Jesus, which was like the whole trump card. Like, you lay your cards on the table and go, oh, you think that's good? Royal Jesus flush, or I don't know. What, I'm not a poker guy, so I don't know. But I'm better than all you. I can trump all of that. And that's what they were doing. And, they were, and there was division because of that. And that was their problem. That was the big issue that Paul has been addressing through these first four chapters but this division, really, when you look at it, when you take a step back and look at it, it was, it was kind of the fruit of a deeper heart problem, a problem of a, of a heart. It was a symptom of an issue of the heart. The problem of elevating themselves was a symptom of the problem of pride. 
of pride. When I think of pride, I think it's one of the most absolute common problems in man. We start thinking we're something, standing on our own, becoming puffed up in our self. And as I'm thinking about this pride in man, I think to myself, what is the solution to pride? Now, I asked that question, what's the solution to pride in first service? Somebody said, humility. And when I think of humility and pride, I think kind of like of opposites, but not the solution. The solution to pride is the gospel. The solution to pride is coming to Jesus at the cross. And, and I wrote here in my notes, the cross is the place that, pl that pride goes to die. Why? Because it's completely, the ground is completely level at the foot of the cross. It's not, I come to the cross and go, well, look at me, look at what I've done, God. I'm better than him, so I get more. No. The cross is where we all say, I can't, but he did. And so this is the place, this is where we need to bring our pride and lay it down at the cross and say, oh, I'm nothing but a sinner who's been saved by amazing grace, amazing love, and so Paul's kind of carrying this thought, you guys, you're dividing over us because of pride, but look at us. You know who we are? We're a bunch of nobodies that have been saved by the somebody, the one. And so Paul is, he's kind of going along this, this same thought, and it's saying, it's not about you, it's not about me, it's all about Jesus. And I think God help us to be that. It's not about you. It's not about me. It's not about this church and that church. It's about Jesus. It's about Jesus. Remember what Jesus said? He said, without me, you can do nothing. And he goes on kind of in a way to say, but with me. And the way he says, but with me, is he says, but if you abide in my words and my words abide in you, you will bear much fruit. That's something but it's not of us. It's of us abiding in him and the fruit naturally growing. I absolutely love the picture of the fruit naturally growing because you never go into a, an orchard and walk through the orange trees and see an orange tree going, oranges, and they're trying so hard to make an orange. Man, all they're doing is hanging out, soaking up the sun, feeding and drinking deep, of the water of life, and it's a picture of us, and fruit naturally comes. Man, hang in there with Jesus. Stay close. Abide in him. Let his word be in us that fruit may come, and it's just an evidence of a people that love the Lord. Fruitfulness and love, love and fruitfulness, these are evidences of the Spirit and the work of God in us. And I have to kind of stop and just say, Lord, I'm so thankful for this little church because I see it. I, I, I walk through here and I see people that are fruity. <laughs> fruity for the Lord. They're just producing fruit. And people that have love and compassion in their hearts and it's an evidence of God. Man, I'm thankful to be a part of this family here. So, Lord, help us be conformed to the image of your Son by your word, through the power of your Spirit. And God, help us to be aware of our pride in ourself. Amen? My sister uh, quoted, uh, she posted a quote from Pastor Steve Gallagher on Facebook the other day. You might have seen it, but I just really liked it. And this is kind of my final note before we get into the text the quote was, if you think you can't be deceived, you're halfway there. It's truth, right? And so I apply it to our text today and would say the same thing. If you think that you can't be proud, you're halfway there. The Bible says to take heed when you think you stand, lest you fall. Halfway there. So Paul starts off with this theme, and he begins with another picture, another analogy of of the ministers, of who he is, who the ministers are, that they've already been dividing over and being proud over. 
And, uh, and he starts there in chapter 4, verse 1, and he says, Let a man so consider us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. So Paul starts out saying, this is how you should view us. This is how you should look at us as two things. If you saw them there, servants and stewards. So, so the first one, servants. You should look at us as servants. The, the word that Paul uses here isn't like the normal word for servant in the Greek, the, the word doulos. It's, it's a different word that has a little bit of a me, different meaning attached to it. It's the word, and I won't be able to say this right, huperates, something like that. But because you didn't know how to say it, you think I said it right. So just think that I said it right. <laughs> now, the idea behind this word is the type of servant, and the main idea attached to it is the idea of an under rower. Now, I don't know what you think of when you hear the word under rower. Um, I, I don't know if you've, if you've ever seen the movie Ben-Hur. I think... It's Ben Hur that starts out with the scene of the guys, and really what you're picturing in your mind is a, a ship, a vessel with a deck, and below deck, maybe above deck, but usually there's a guy like some muscle bound captain guy beating on a drum, right? Do, 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 and the guys are in there and they're all rowing. There's a bunch of slaves underneath the, the, the deck and they're all rowing together. And so they're. they're working together for a greater cause. And he, in this picture of an under rower, to me, are some awesome illustrations. I, I love the picture of an under rower because there's a few things. Number one, God, or, or it has the idea of serving the Lord or serving together with a group, together getting somewhere, Right? For the cause of something that's greater than yourself. But there has to be togetherness. There has to be the drum. There has to be unity. And when you're working together, you're going somewhere. But it also has the idea of not gaining attention. Not being seen, right? All you would see from the outside of the under rowers are the oars sticking out, right? And moving back and forth. That's the only way you'd know that they were there. So literally, not being seen, and then, of course, working for the same cause. And usually, it was for the cause of getting either the gear or the um, cargo or people to their destination safely. And so when I think about this, I think, shouldn't we be like this? Shouldn't we be serving together in unison for the greater cause of Jesus not worried about notoriety, not worried about recognition, but simply concerned, genuinely concerned that people would be on board and going to that final destination, the final harbor on the golden shores that we would be sharing the gospel and bringing people to Jesus. And this is Paul's heart. Number one, we're under rowers. We're servants working together for the greater cause of God. And number two, we're stewards. Steward was being a steward, was being a servant, but it was usually a different type of servant. You might already know this, but it was a servant, not like a slave, um, like the lowly kind of slave you would think of, walk around in shackles. It was kind of a higher slave. It, it, was, it was somebody who was really a manager of the uh, master's goods. And their goal, their idea, their goal in life was to increase what the master had and take good care of it. So that's what being a steward was. When I think of a steward, I, I go back Old Testament to Joseph. Joseph was a steward in Potiphar's house. You remember that? He was an overseer and he had reign over everything except for Potiphar's wife. And we, we know the story. There was a crazy old thing that happened in there, but that's a great picture, an example. And then, because he was faithful in that, you guys remember, he became really the steward of Egypt, the whole nation. And he had the, the freedom to just go ahead and reign over Egypt. Absolutely incredible. But this is what Paul's referring to. Paul says that he's a steward, that they are stewards. And, they, and then he goes on to say what they're stewards of. is stewards over the mysteries of God. And what is the mystery of God? Well, a few weeks back, we learned what the mystery of God was. It's the gospel. It's the gospel. 
It's the gospel and it's all that we receive, the mysteries of how amazing it is and what we receive when we, be, when we become recipients or we accept the gospel of Jesus. Paul is striving to be a good steward of the gospel. And can I just stop for a minute and say, up to this point, he has been doing an excellent job. I absolutely love where he's taken us so far in regards to the gospel. And just kind of by way of reminder, his endeavor was to preach Christ crucified and that alone. To preach the message of the cross and Christ crucified. And his whole thing was not by cunning devised words, worldly wisdom, not taking away or adding to Just preaching the simple gospel because the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. And Paul, man, he's been doing good at it. Saying you don't need the slick words, you need the truth. Remember, we looked at, if you can get argued into heaven, well, surely you can get argued out of heaven. But you can't get argued out of the power of the gospel. The power of a changed life impacted by the truth of the gospel of Jesus. And in verse 2, Paul goes on to say what's required of a steward and the ministry of a steward. And it's in verse 2 there. Let's take a look. It says, Moreover, it is required in stewards that one be found faithful. Paul goes on and says there is a requirement of, of the steward, and it's an important requirement. It's to be faithful. Before we go into looking at what being faithful is, let's take a minute and look at what being faithful isn't. Are you guys hearing a ringing? Is this in my head? I'm going to turn this one off because I always turn that one off when something happens. Okay. Sometimes your ears ring and you think, is it me? Okay. It's still doing it. All right. We'll give the sound guy something to work on. Okay. So what, what, what's not a, a faithful steward? Let me just give you a few examples of what's not a faithful steward. Number one is, it's not, you don't have to be an eloquent speaker. We just mentioned that. You don't have to be highly educated with your doctorate in theology to be a faithful steward. Now, that could be a good thing, but you don't have to have it. You don't have to be especially relevant to a crowd to be a good steward of the mystery. And it's not even up to the to the steward. It's not even about the success of the steward. It's about the faithfulness of the steward. And a, a little side note here, the success of a steward of God is going to look different than what the world would view success as. But here's a requirement. The requirement is that you would be faithful. That you would be faithful. Not that you'd be perfect, that you'd be faithful. What is the definition of faithful? Faithful faithful means loyal, consistent, and steadfast. Now, when I was going through first service, all of a sudden, just rabbit, squirrel, whatever you want to call it, popped in my mind, and immediately I thought of Old Faithful. Why is Old Faithful called Old Faithful? Because it keeps shooting off. It keeps going off, and it's consistent, and it's regular. Old faithful. And so this is the thing, that we would become old faithful, plugging away day after day, consistently stewarding the gospel of Jesus. My wife goes, oh, wow. I'm like, you don't know me. (laughs) Ask my wife. Okay, no. My wife, she loves me. Verse 5. Therefore, judge nothing before the time until the Lord comes, who will both bring to light the hidden things of darkness and reveal the counsel of the heart. So Paul goes right in and says, look, God sees all the hidden things. You think you did it in the dark? He saw it. You think nobody saw it? He did. So, and this call is, man, live your life for God and before him. Don't care about what people think. He sees. And then, you notice what he says there? And then he says, each one's praise will come from God. That's crazy. Each one's praise, each one's reward will come from God. You know, when we're standing before God, there's really not a whole lot that we can, like, give to Jesus except for the reward of the service of those things in our life that Paul talked about last chapter that didn't get burned away in the judgment. 
the things that were just for him and that were, that were honest and done with the right intents of the heart, we're going to get that in heaven <laughs> and we're going to get to give it to Jesus and lay it at his feet. And so, I mean, we're not living for rewards, but at the same time, we're living for the glory of Jesus, that we can take those rewards and give them to him because, man, it's going to be sad when we stand before Jesus and we give him, you know, in the Bible, they're crowns, right? When we give him those crowns, and, and one of the teachers that I really like says, I'm just going to give him one of those little beanie hats that spins. That's what I'm going to give him. You know, because I just, I'm, I'm nobody, I'm nothing, but man, we need to live to store up, and this is what he's talking about, Jesus. He said, store up your treasures in heaven where moth and rust cannot destroy. Okay, so verse 6, moving on. Now these things, brethren, I have figuratively transferred to myself and Apollos for your sakes, that you may learn in us not to think beyond what is written, that none of you may be puffed up on behalf of one against the other. So you kind of get what he's saying here. It would seem that Paul's referring back to the apostles and saying, I'm showing you pictures of who we are. What did he say this chapter? Servant, under rower, and a steward. Last chapter, he said gardeners, right? Uh, one plants, one waters. He said builders. I'm laying a foundation. Apollos is building upon it. So he's given them kind of like these blue-collar examples uh, of what they are. This is what we are. We're nobody. We're, we're nothing that you would not think beyond what is written. I really like that, that little phrase. Because sometimes we get in the trap, pride, of thinking beyond what is written thinking we're somebody, we're something. And Paul's basically saying, no, you judge everything by this, what is written. Who you are, by what is written. Who I am, by what is written. And that's what we want to do. That we wouldn't think beyond what is written. And, and so he's go, going on to say that you've elevated us. And there in the text, he's showing us what's happened. As, as they're elevating, they're becoming puffed up. That's pride. And they're causing division on behalf of one against the other. Division that those guys don't want. Obviously, Paul and Apollos don't want the body of Christ to be divided. Then he goes on, and he kind of says, no matter who it is and no matter what their gifting is, because of this reason, verse 7, for who makes you differ from another? And what do you have that you did not receive? Now, if you indeed received it, then why do you boast as if you had not received it? Absolutely love this section. Paul's calling it out and saying, who made Paul different than Apollos? Who made me different than you? God. God's the one who gave Apollos a gift and gave Paul a gift and, and gave them different things so what do you have that you haven't gotten from him? Answer, nothing. <laughs> Absolutely nothing. Everything we have is from him. Our talents, our gifts, man, they're not of us. I got to, I got to point out to the, to the big guys from Phoenix, the big group of guys in first service at the skate park, and tell them, hey, if you're an awesome skater, guess what? It's not you. You didn't give yourself those talents. God did. He gave you the ability to be athletic. Man, there's just something cool about seeing an athletic person do their thing that I can't do. And I'm like, whoa, dang, you know, I can't. there's no way I could ollie off of the thing and then land on the other deal. I would be dead in one second. And you can look at that and go, wow, or like I think of an Olympic runner just going, whoa. See, I, was, I had the award in school of being the slowest man alive. So I don't know what it's like to be gracefully bounding down a track at 30 miles an hour, what, however fast. So, But I can see that, and I can see the beauty of the gifting and go, man, God, you're awesome. How awesome. And then in my own life, you know, I'm, I'm, I, you know, I get the gift of music. I'm so thankful for that gift. It's so awesome. But when people come up and go, whoa, Isaac, man, that's so awesome, I get to just tell them, you know, thank you, number one. Thank you for acknowledging that. But you know, the gift is it's not me. It's God. He's given the gift of music, and I want to use it for him. And that's all there is to it. I didn't decide 
I didn't wake up in the morning and say, I'm going to sing today. That never happened. He put the song in my heart. Amen. So he's saying this. Uh, I had another idea kind of in through this text. Have you ever heard that phrase? It's kind of like a thing. It's like, you do you or you be true to you, that kind of thing. I had a thought about this because that's only true when you're being true to who God made you to be. There's all kind of voices in this world that even though they say you be you, they're still trying to say you be me. <laughs> you be cool. What's your definition of cool? No, you be what God has designed you to be. And just be that and bloom. And if you're an orange tree and I'm a banana bush, then that's different or whatever. I don't know. Did bananas have trees? I heard they were like a, a, some kind of weed or I don't, I don't know what a banana is, but they're good. So anyways, I thank God for his gift and bananas as well. So, man, when we boast in ourselves, Paul says at the end there, when we boast in ourselves, we're acting like we had something to do with what God's done. And so we don't want to do that. And then Paul goes on, he moves on, and he kind of gets a little sarcastic here. He, he, he gets a little amped up, and, and, he, and he's, he kind of says, look, you guys, I wish you'd judge yourselves, and you, you, but you're judge, you are, really. You're judging yourselves in a way where you look at other people and other churches and apostles and leaders and ministries, and you think, oh, well, look at me. I'm better than that. I'm above those people, and I'm above that thing. And so he starts here in verse 8. He says, but you are already full. You are already rich. You have already reigned as kings without us. Indeed, I, I wish, I'm sorry, indeed, I could wish you did reign and that we might reign with you. For I think that God has displayed us, the apostles, last as men condemned to death. For we have been made a spectacle to the world, both to angels and to men. So right off the bat, he, he's, he's, he's showing them how they are, he's referring to how they are seeing themselves, that they're something in who they are, right? Like what he just talked about. They're boasting in the gift and thinking it's of them. They're already full, they're already rich, and in their mind, they're already kings. And really, historically, that church was. They were wealthy, they were in that hub, they had influence in the community, they, 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 they weren't really strong on the gospel, but they were strong on a lot of other political things and platforms. And so we kind of see that throughout history, but they were definitely seeing themselves as high compared to others. And like I said, in some way, in worldly ways, they were. But a thought here, you know what happens when a person is full? There's no room for anything else. And when you're full of yourself and who you are, there's no room for Jesus. He will not force his way into somebody who's full. He'll wait until we come to the cross and empty ourselves. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. But I like what Paul says next. He says, I wish that you did reign Man, I wish you knew the truth. I wish you were living, reigning spiritually, not fleshly. And then he says, but look, this is who we are. This is who you are versus who we are. And he's going to get back into that a little bit more. But he calls themselves spectacles. And a spectacle is not just those glasses you need to read the pages. Spectacles, is that right? Is that the right word? Yeah, okay. So spectacles are also, and, and it kind of goes in with Roman and Roman conquests. When Rome would go conquer an area, they would bring back, they'd have like a victory parade, like a march, and they'd bring the soldiers through first, then the spoils of the war, all of the, they'd like kind of revel and look at what we did, and then they'd bring up the prisoners that were in chains, kind of being drug along and beaten, and they were ma being made a spectacle. And then so many times they would take them right to the Colosseum and they would push them into the Colosseum and they would loose the lions and they would, they would let the gladiators out and they would make them a spectacle. And they would do that for entertainment. Watch people get beat. And you know the crazy thing is, is in church history later on, Christians were thrown into those arenas because of Jesus. Let the tigers out, the lions, whatever, being 
killed by gladiators. But Paul is saying, look, this is what we are. We're spectacles. And he continues on kind of in this sarcasm. Verse 10, he says, We are fool for Christ's sake, but you are wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are distinguished, and we are dishonored. Of course, the we is the apostles, and the them is the church at Corinth. You might have according to the world, but according to the things of the Spirit, Paul's saying you're lacking, you're not growing, you're babies. Remember, he said that last week. I was going to say babes, but babies. And Jesus didn't come and say, you know what, live according to your desires and whatever you want and take up your money and take up your things and follow me. He said, deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. And Paul continues on in verse 11. To the present hour, we both hunger and thirst. We are poorly clothed and beaten and homeless, and we labor working with our own hands, being reviled, we bless. Being persecuted, we endure. Being defamed, we entreat. We have been made as the filth of the world, the offscoring of all things until now. So Paul is saying, you know how you live, your standards and the way that you live, and now what we look like, to you it's more the world. But to us, persecuted for the Lord. It's just an interesting section here. And I think it's easy for us to look at this and go, well, that doesn't really relate to me that much, but I think it really does. And I think to myself, Lord, we want to live for you. We want to be humble. We want to be this, what, what Paul is saying. Again, help us not to be full of our self, but full of your spirit. And he says there in something in verse 12 that's interesting. He says, we labor working with our own hands. This is kind of an interesting idea that does a couple of things because in the Greek culture, it was a detestable thing to work with your hands. It was like, ew, I don't want to work with my hands. Gross. That's why I have servants. So I don't have to touch the whatever it is, take the trash out or what, whatever it is in that Greek culture. And secondly, this was something that Paul, working with his hands, was known for, right? What did he do? He was a tent maker. And over and over, he would, he would recall that. Look, I, I work outside of the ministry in order to provide so I don't have to be a burden on any of these churches that I'm planting. And God had given him a talent to be able to do that, to go and work in order to plant churches, but he says, through all the things, the persecutions that we go through, we continue, we bless, we endure, we lift up, we keep going. And there you are, Corinthians, looking down at our work. Like you're, we are beneath you because you have servants, because you have whatever it is. And so then he goes into this next section I absolutely love. In verse 14, he says, And I do not write these things to shame you, but as my beloved, beloved children... I warn you. His heart and his intent. Look, I'm not trying to make you feel bad. I'm not trying to shame you. But as my children, I warn you. He goes on to say, For though you might have uh, 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet you do not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I have begotten or birthed you through the gospel. So he tells them, Paul's saying, Look, I. I know that you have all this stuff and these things, and I, and I know that I'm coming at you difficult in a difficult way. It's hard. It's hard to swallow. It's hard to hear. But you have all of these, these teachers and all these people who will kind of give you what you want to hear. And here's one of the things that would happen. A lot of times when Paul would go share in a church and stay there for a while, as soon as he left, somebody would swoop into that pulpit and say, hey, now Paul's cool, but you got to know this and this and this and this and try to undercut what Paul was teaching. And Paul says, look, these guys have an agenda. you got so many teachers that will tell you what you want to hear. How many fathers do you have? And he paints this picture of being a father. There's something about being a parent. And being a parent, as in being a parent, the goal isn't to be their buddy. Hey, and always be their friend and always tell them what's right. The goal is to parent the child. The goal is to say you're not doing that. But why? Because it will hurt you, and I'm your dad. 
I'm not the pal down the street. And Paul is saying, this is what I am to you. I am warning you for your own good. You're full of pride. You're full of yourself, and it's hard to hear, and I know it. You don't like me, but I'm just going to tell you as a father, as somebody who cares, a spiritual father. In verse 16, he says, I urge you, imitate me. That's awesome. (laughs) I look at that and go, oh, because so many times in the church nowadays, people are saying, just look at Jesus. Don't look at me. Look at Jesus. Paul is saying, look at Jesus, but if you want to know how, why don't you come on, let's go together. Let's walk together. That's discipleship. That's apprenticeship. Discipleship means apprenticeship. It means somebody, and you know what an apprentice is? It's hands-on. You come and you do what I'm doing, and you learn from me. And that's what Paul is saying. Listen, imitate me. But it also goes a step deeper because it's a father saying, I'm not just going to tell you what to do. I'm going to show you how to do it by the way that I live my life. And, and, and spiritually speaking, we all should have a father that we look to, that we'll listen to, and we'll hear hard things from. But spiritually spe- speaking, we should also all be a father or a mother to someone, be able to let them look at our life and say, I'm not quite perfect, but God's so good. Well, let's go do this together. Let's serve together. Let's grow together. It's the best way to learn. So verse 17, he says, For this reason I have sent Timothy to you, who is my beloved and faithful son in the Lord, who will remind you of my ways in Christ as I teach everywhere in every church. So Paul says, man, look, I'm going, I'm on the mission field, I'm teaching everywhere, every church. I'm, I'm, I'm out there. I want to come to you, but for now, I'm sending a trusted servant. I'm sending Timothy to you. He's my beloved, faithful son. He's going to come and he's going to have the job of doing something. And I love it here because he doesn't say he's going to show you some new thing that you need in the Lord. No. He's going to remind you of the things of my ways, he says, in Christ. Which that's what we're looking at right now. We are looking at this letter of Paul and guess what? It's a part of the word of God, the very word of God to us. And that's what we're doing. That's what we need. Nothing new. We need to be reminded of the truth of God. Amen? So, verse 18, Now some of you are puffed up as though I were not coming to you, but I will come to you shortly if the Lord wills, and I will know not the words of those who are puffed up, but the power For the kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. And then he closes in verse 21 and says, What do you want? Shall I come to you with a rod or in love and a spirit of gentleness? Woo! That's a father right there. He's going, do you want a spanking? Or do you want to straighten up on your own? Uh, I mean, that's what a rod was. A rod was something used by a shepherd to whack a sheep. And why are we whacking sheep? Because they're going out in a place that's dangerous for them. A place where the wolves are on the edge, on the fringes. And shouldn't we love each other enough to say, Hey, what are you doing, man? I haven't seen you in a while. Come back where it's safe, man. Safety's in the middle of the flock. Oh, getting all wooly with all the sheep. Getting out there on your own is where you fall. It's where you get hurt. And that's what Paul's saying, man. I want to keep you in here. And I'll come with the rod. Woo, man, I can't wait to meet Paul in heaven. It's going to be crazy. Say, man, tell me exactly what you were thinking. (laughs) But he goes on in this section, and he he says some interesting things that sometimes I think are hard for us to grasp. But he says, "Um, I'm going to come, and I will know not the words of those who are puffed up, but the power. Basically, what Paul is saying is that I'm going to be able to know the difference of those who are talking the talk but not walking the walk. I'm going to come and see. And you might say all these puffed up and look at me and all what I'm doing, but I'm going to know by the fruit. I'm going to know by the power of God and the gospel. Is it worked out in your life? I'll be able to see the difference. 
And the difference is that power, the power of the gospel and the work of the Holy Spirit to change someone's life. So I want to ask Caleb to come up as we close. And Man, next chapter, he goes right into another humongous sin. Don't read ahead. <laughs> ah, you can read ahead if you want. Another humongous sin and just revealing to us the truth of the fact of the matter that they are fooling themselves. They're calling themselves Christians and walking in darkness. When you call yourself a Christian, you're calling yourself a child of the light. And they're walking in darkness, and, and, and Paul's going to reveal this to him, that they're fooling themselves, that they're walking with words and not with power of the gospel and the changed life. And so as we wrap up this morning, I want to challenge us to follow Jesus and to be his apprentice, to follow him and to have the power of the gospel and a changed life being evident and working in us. I mean, isn't that what we want? To change and to grow and to become more like him. Let's all stand together. To learn from him and to glean, to allow the word by the Spirit to be power in our lives. So God, this morning we come before you and we want this in our lives. We want the reality of the gospel working out in our lives. We want to be changed by the word of God. We don't want to be walking in word, puffed upness. So we come to the cross and I pray you'd help us to be humble before you and to come low, to lay down our self and our pride. I thank you that you show us that we need to <laughs> come back and not stay close to those edges, Lord. So we thank you, we praise you this morning. God, help us to continue to lay our life down, to grow in you. What good is it to gain the whole world or lose your soul? What good is it to make a sweet sound but remain proud? In view of God's mercy, I offer my Take my life and let it be everything of me. Here I am, use me for your glory. In everything I say and do, let my life on you. Here I am, living for your glory. And God, may that be our heart this morning. Lord, we thank you again for your word. We thank you for the medicine that it is to us, Lord. God, it's a need. We need to hear from you. We need to hear what you say about our own hearts, Lord. God, I pray that you help us to keep growing and keep moving forward in our relationship with you. We thank you that the power to do it is in you. Lord, help us to bear fruit for you. We ask in Jesus' name. And all God's children said, amen, amen. God bless you guys.